Hello and welcome to Greenfleet Talks. My name is Kate Armitage and I'm your host for our discussion today. I am delighted to be joined by Colin Patterson, Head of Marketing at Drive Tech UK. Hello, Colin. Hello, Kate. Hi, it's great to be with you today. Yeah, and it's a pleasure talking to you as well, Colin. Um, by way of introduction, would you mind telling me a little bit more about Drive Tech UK and, and what you do? Yes, of course. Um, we're a, we, we'd like to think we're a leader in driver training in its simplest form. Uh, we, we talk about driver risk management, so managing risks predominantly in businesses that operate fleets. Um, most people know that there's a duty of care to your employees, whether they're on the road or elsewhere on your premises. Um, and our specialism is to provide that sort of all embracing driver training duty of care to make sure that your drivers are safe, legal and able to go about their business in a safe and positive way. That's, that's um, we're great. Part of, we're part of the AA, um, so we are part of a fairly large and respectable motoring organisation, and that gives us, I think, some extra additional strength. Okay, and I'm assuming, and we'll come on to this later, uh, that as well as duty of care and driver safety, there are environmental benefits as well to teaching people it, it, to it, drive Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we, some of the subject matter we're going to talk around on COP26 is, is inherent about you know, environmental improvements. But yes, we do have a very definite knock-on effect in the driver training we apply in that it has almost a direct correlation in terms of environmental impact being reduced. Perfect. Uh, so as you've mentioned, uh, at the end of this month, uh, the 26th Conference of the Parties, better known as COP26, opens in Glasgow, where the world's leaders will come together to agree actions and targets on the long-term goal to become net zero by 2050. Today, uh, you and I are going to be discussing the role that zero emission vehicles play on this global stage uh, and where the UK can take the lead uh, and the role that Drive Tech UK is playing in this transition. So Colin, COP26 is a pivotal moment for world leaders, businesses and communities to come together to encourage tangible actions to tackle climate emergency. In your opinion, what do you think will make a successful COP26? Um, challenging question to start with, and I think a lot of the commentary and narrative around COP26 starts with a bit of cynicism. A lot of talk, no action. So it's easy to say, but my own measure would be clear actions that can be delivered as broadly across the globe as possible. Um, and with some timelines. So that's still fairly high level. But I, I think my main, my personal view is, as long as it doesn't come away and the vast majority of reportage is that it's been another talking shop, it's been paying lip service to an issue um, and nothing is going to be tangibly addressed. But my own instinct is actually things are hotting up. Maybe I'm reading too much into the current press, but there has been a lot of pre-activity and I, I'm starting to see commitment, certainly from national UK government, to fund and invest in actions that are going to drive the impact on carbon down and down. Yeah, I think and I think the the UK has had a focus on this for quite a few years. Um, and I would say potentially more than uh, some other countries. Um, and I don't want to get into the politics because I can't, um, I, I don't know enough, but we know that America's had a wobble recently coming out of the Paris Agreement and then going back in. And China similarly is, is having having a few, a few challenges. So um, yeah. it, it's great, I think, to see that the UK is, is at least at the forefront of this and is setting the agenda and is, is setting the, the pace. I, I, I agree. Um, and I, I think the other, I, again, you mentioned the political angle, and I don't want to go too much into, say, UK politics. But I think this is a refreshing opportunity to distract from discussions around Brexit, discussions around shortage of HGV drivers and all the other issues that we're facing at the moment. This is a global issue. And I guess I, I talked about actionable and tangible things that come out of it with some fixed timescales. My other again, personal view, and probably my own apathy around this, is that I think the recognition after COP26 has been publicised is that this is not anyone else's problem. It's all our problem. 
Um, you know, and I think if that comes across, yeah, leave it to the governments to talk about it. I don't think is going to be a suitable outcome. I think we've all got to realise that we've got our part to play in what is a, a, a fairly dangerous global issue that's mm. looming. Yep, yep. And, and uh, um, a sen there is, I think, a, a sense of optimism um, amongst the public in terms of these positive things that we can do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, what what is Drive Tech UK doing as a business uh, and with your employees to support achieving the net zero targets? Um, we, uh, I mentioned earlier, we're part of the AA, so that's quite a large British organisation. Drive Tech's footprint, uh, we we amount for about 130 employees. So, I have to say, in our own control, we probably don't have a massive scaled impact. But um, A, we have been applying a lot of environmental uh, policies and procedures into the business to save money, save energy. And of course, if you then gross that up to the AA, who have much broader um, impact on premises, on breakdown fleets, on AA driving school fleets, I think particularly, and you would expect this from a motoring organization, we're focused particularly on our vehicular um, outputs. Um, back to drive tech, our salespeople are all now driving electric vehicles. Um, we did go through hybrid, but most of them are now converting to pure play electric. Um, and as I say, I think what, what COP26 I feel is doing in the AA is making sure that we firm up and make get policies that are more clearly declared about net zero. Um, so I think we're all fully intending to improve and make benefits along the way. But I think what's happening with COP26 is the, you know, the AA is now starting to talk about publishing a very clear policy to get us to net zero. And I think that's another benefit of COP26. More and more organisations will start doing that. Yeah. And it's so important, Colin. Uh, and I know it's much easier said than done, but it's so important that as a business, you walk the walk and talk the talk. Um, you know, if you're giving this advice to other fleets in terms of how how through driver training you can drive efficiencies, then um, you know to evidence that through what the AA fleet is doing and through what the drive tech fleet is doing is, is yes. an important part yeah. of that. I mean, Kate, you kindly mentioned it earlier. There is a direct correlation between safe driving practices and economic driving, and therefore less normally less emissions and less pollution. But so it goes without saying, and I'm probably slipping into a salesy message here. The biggest impact I think Drive Tech has is on the reach that we have with our customers. So we're conveying messages about driving safer, driving slower, driving more sensibly, and that will have an impact perhaps bigger than just the impact that Drive Tech can have as an entity. Great, and that and that's that's actually my next question. So the, one of the key objectives of COP26 is to speed the uptake of electric vehicles. Um, and what is Drive Tech doing to support your customers and businesses and public sector to achieve this? Okay, um, we uh, to some extent the conversion from ICE internal combustion engine vehicles through to electric is almost an inevitability. But what we've done is we've adapted a number of our training courses and modules and made some very, very specific to EV adoption, EV familiarization. Um, so we have a quite a wide portfolio of products, um, on-road driver training, online driver training. But what we have done in the last 12 months is apply that very specifically to the EV marketplace and understanding that there are different motivations to take up EV we've developed products um, that we've made available to our customers, predominantly what I would call EV familiarization, but this is about perhaps to disarm people with issues around range anxiety, safety of driving the vehicle and, and physical familiar, familiarization with slightly different modus operandi, single pedals, regenerative braking, um, issues like it's the silence the fact that the vehicles are actually dangerously silent under normal circumstances and lightning acceleration so we're we've basically embedded into our training modules education that tries to a get people feeling positive about ev disarm some of the issues around range anxiety i you might come on to charging infrastructure in a while but i, I think one of the biggest issues is concern over charging infrastructure but 
what we're trying to do is imbue uh, a positive confidence into people that they can get into an EV vehicle, drive it safely, and realise that they're making a really good contribution. And Colin, this we I I talk about this a lot um, in in the in the Green Fleet forums, but it's so important that drivers, uh, new, the, the new EV drivers have a good experience, that that handover uh, and that they have the confidence in the vehicle. And and I think we, we are still, whether we like it or not, I think there are um, uh, s something in the region of 350,000 battery electric vehicles in the UK at the moment, which actually yeah. is, a, is a relatively small amount when you look at the whole vehicle park. So the people that are going into these cars now are choosing it. They want it. It's a proactive decision. They're very comfortable with that decision. They need help and support with the handover because it may not exactly be what they were expecting. But in three, four, five years time, and as we get closer to 2030, when it won't be possible to buy uh, an ICE manual vehicle, um, you're going to have you're going to come across a millions and millions of drivers who are potentially quite anxious about this, who are very much out of their comfort zone uh, and, and who are, have maybe built up in their head all kinds of horror stories. Uh, and, and what you're doing is going to really help address that and make sure that this transition is smooth. Yes. Yeah. Um, the only I wouldn't take issue with what you've said. The only experience we've got is that in the business community, where I think the main drive is taking place at the moment yeah. because of corporate social responsibility, desire to have a corporate policy on net zero. It's the company making the decision to move rapidly or many yeah. are making the decision to move rapidly to EV adoption, not necessarily the driver. So True. that's our yeah. experience is that the driver, that they're, they're not dissenting and utterly resistant but there is a sort of attempt you've still got to disarm some people because they haven't been the primary decider that they will switch from a ice vehicle to yeah. an EV. Yeah. Um, and I think that's particularly true of van fleets uh, yeah. where it's where it's a business tool and, and the driver doesn't have any decision on what they're getting into every day. Absolutely, um, absolutely. So, so I do agree with you but I could just see that that the the low-hanging fruit if you like um, you know, the people who, who want to make that transition, they're, they're the people we're seeing now. And as you get closer to 2030, you're going to have quite a lot of cynics and sceptics and, and possibly really quite anxious people who yes. are very, uh, you know, just just not comfortable with driving an automatic vehicle. Yeah. And okay. we see big opportunity. I mean, it's not necessarily part of our commitment at the moment. So you asked what we're doing. We predominantly offer EV familiarisation to the business community. Yeah. But what's to say there isn't a much broader opportunity to take your point? Yeah. That there are going to be a lot of consumers, uh, the normal distribution, early adopters, the middle band and then the laggards. But there will probably be an accentuated desire to educate as we head towards 2030. So totally agree. Uh, if you could pass that on to your colleagues at the AA driving school, because I think they should do EV driving lessons for people who have already passed their test. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's sort of, I, I think that's what we're noticing, not only in vehicle changing, but also actually road guidance. So smart motorways and education, things yeah. are changing in the infrastructure as well as vehicles. Yeah. But I'm, I'm now picking up on another aspect of our business. I, I didn't mention at the beginning, we, we, we are one of the UK's largest deliverers of driver offender courses. So if yeah. you're caught speeding, you might be encouraged to go on a course delivered by a company like DriveTech. But the fascinating output of that is we, we process perhaps about half a million delegates a year. It's fascinating. Most of them will come in a little bit begrudging to start with, but most of them go out afterwards, 98% of them, in fact, go out saying best experience since I passed my driving test. <laughs> and the first time that somebody's talked about road safety, speeding, changes in infrastructure, smart motorways. So it's not just about the transition to EV. It's the infrastructure on the road is changing. Um, yeah. but what That's average driver, changing. having driven 20 years, is keeping up? to steam with those changes and the impact. That's really interesting, Colin. That's really interesting because you, you, I think you mentioned it, or certainly I've read it on your in your literature. Of course, the talk on, an, on a full battery electric vehicle is fantastic. Um, so, you know, we might see people inadvertently speeding because it's very easy to get above 30 miles an hour very quickly. 
Um, and very quietly, yes. And very yeah. quietly, yeah. It, it okay, well, we're going off. You. We're going off topic a little bit. So let, let's bring the conversation back to COP twenty six. Yes. Um, all eyes will be on the UK uh, because we are the host, uh, and it, we've made this commitment to the delivery of, of vehicle electrification. But what more can the UK do to lead the way with the demonstration of EV charging infrastructure combined with this? clean, innovative vehicle technology? Um, my uh, very personal view, uh, I'm one of the, I think there's a quote somewhere, and I might have got the number wrong, 8 million or so households. I'm one of them. I don't actually have an easy charging uh, facility at home, so I don't have off-road parking. So it's a, maybe it's a sort of microcosmic view, but what impact, and I, I do, having read the government's net zero policy document yesterday, they have invested a substantial amount of money to recognize that there are a lot of people for whom EV charging at home, which is probably the most sensible time to do it overnight or when you're parked up, haven't got the facility, but they are investing. And I think that's one of the most significant things that, that the UK government can do is recognize to get mass adoption. You're going to have to appeal to a lot of those households. I, I have a reasonably big family and we happen to have four vehicles, but none of those vehicles can access a charging point at home at the moment. I, so definitely. I'm not converted to EV, but I think that's a major commitment the government have got to make. Yeah. Okay. That's um, so. Um, there is a little bit of context there because the um, uh, the currently the home charge grant, uh, which is for people who do have private off road parking that's yes. suitable for an EV. Um, they, they're eligible for a grant for a cheaper wall box, but actually that's being phased out in March next year and it is going to be replaced with another grant that may not be suitable for you, Colin, but is definitely targeted at those households that have been struggling with the infrastructure. So um, multi-tenanted properties and rented properties as well. So I think it's much more focusing on the landlords and how to help them get get properties yes, uh, yeah. ready uh, and of um, course the on-street infrastructure which is what you're going to need uh, and, and Kate the biggest observation and I don't think I'll be the first to have made it, it uh, some of a generation a few years ago might remember the archetypal VHS you know the Betamax <laughs> video battle for platform um, I, I, my observation I don't currently drive an EV although we've been experimenting and using EVs in the business quite a lot so I've driven quite a few the biggest problem I think I have as a human being is is the variability in charging infrastructure, the yeah. different devices, the different plugins, the different charging platforms. I think that's probably one of the blocks that I have yeah. um, in that I, I do currently know how to fill up with fuel. I drive onto a forecourt, there's a, flat, there's a metal nozzle and it's very simple. Yeah. Whereas I think there's a bit of intimidation and sense of uncertainty, depending which unit am I going to drive up to, how am I going to charge on this one, and how can I actually pay for it. But that, I think, the government, and this is quite a big infrastructure challenge, but needs to streamline and simplify that process. Mm. <laughs> so, a tough one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so we we know that OZEV has been looking at that consumer experience, and it's it's a really big challenge. Um, ideally, the preference is to let the market decide, but so far the market has proved that it is unable to put put in infrastructure that is um, interoperable and. Yes. and um, uh, totally publicly accessible. There are examples, uh, you know, the Netherlands have done a great job with that uh, and Germany is making moves towards that as well. So um, hopefully uh, we'll see that in the next few years. I agree with you. I think it's absolutely fundamentally important. Um, and the longer we continue to not have a joined up public infrastructure, um, I think the, it, the harder it is for users to access it. Yes, I, I yes. certainly, I certainly have to um, spend some time when I'm doing a journey I haven't done before thinking about where I'm going to charge, how am I going to access it, um, how how reliable is it, uh, all of those questions. Yeah. yeah. So, so Colin, um, we've just uh, we're coming we're coming towards the end, but I I really wanted to mention the uh, Green Fleet. Um, EV Rally of Scotland, Evros, uh, yes. which we're hosting. 
Um, it's a five day, 1200 mile electric tour of Scotland uh, that commences on the 8th of November and runs through uh, uh, to the 12th of November during COP. Uh, I'm delighted that DriveTech UK is supporting this as a partner. Can you tell me a little bit more about your involvement? and Absolutely. Enrollment? We, By the way, I don't want to be too um, praising, but I, I think the Greenfleet initiative to do this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it's been one of the most exciting things that we've focused on in the last few months within the organization. So A, I think it's a great idea. Great. Um, I, I think to ally it, run it concurrently with COP26 was genius. Um, and for a number of reasons, those plus the fact that we pride ourselves on our position as a, a, a we hope a good driver training organization, we were delighted to participate. So our, our role is that we're going to be, we're the driver training partner for Evros. Um, and we have two participants. We'll have one vehicle in the in the rally, um, which will be a, a, a VW ID three by, as it happens. Nice. Um, but we've got two really well qualified people. We've got a, a gentleman called um, Keith Freeman, who Greenfleet Magazine have very kindly nicknamed EV Keith, um, <laughs> and Keith is one of our most experienced driver training managers. Um, he's got a depth, of, a depth of knowledge and experience. However. I'm, I, I've been sworn mainly by Keith to make sure I don't set him up for a fall. He's a lovely bloke and Keith is very qualified. He understands safe economic driving and has been teaching and setting up programs for many, many years. So we're participating, but unlike the sort of EV Keith uh, Stig of Evros uh, label that he's been given, he's just at pains to make sure I say he doesn't want to beat anyone. He doesn't want to sort of win. His objective really is to just share knowledge, drive, partake in the rally, share information with people and hope that everyone improves as a result. He's certainly not in it to try and impress with his own expertise, just to share it. Um, but we're really excited about it. It's a great week and we're looking forward to it a lot. I, I must mention his co-driver, Emma. So I think Emma Loveday, one of our business uh, consultants, is going to be Keith's co-driver. And I'm sure for safety, we'll also take time at the wheel to give Keith a rest. But we're really excited about it. I, I think it's going to be a cracking week. Uh, well, I'm very excited about it as well. And I'm, I'm delighted um, to hear uh, that, that Keith uh, and Emma are taking part. I uh, am also uh, driving a vehicle only for one day. Um, uh, and like Keith, I don't think I'm going to be winning any rosettes for arriving first. <laughs> so uh, have, have you got any tips for me to, to improve my driving performance? Um, I, I mean, I, I'd have to get Keith to speak to you rather than me because he, he'd accused me of being an amateur. But I, I, I think just certainly for this rally and the nature of the topography and geography of Scotland is plan, plan and plan. So we've talked about that in terms of picking out infrastructure and charging points. But I think for the nature of rural Scotland, it would just to be make sure you plan your journey each day. Um, what's the nature of the drive? What's the most optimum route that you're going to take? And I, I know the organisers are going to define the charging points, but just make sure that you're comfortable and not distracted or stressed by worrying about where to charge and concentrate on driving safely and enjoying it. Oh, Colin, that's fantastic advice. Uh, and I will, I promise you, I will plan, plan, plan. Uh, and I will make, make sure I, I don't break too, too aggressively and get the benefit of the regen uh, breaking. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I'm going to do a shout out to Kia, who have very kindly given me a seat in one of their cars for the event. Brilliant. Uh, so uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be Kia versus VW. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, we have got other vehicles taking part as well. So it's going to be a fabulous event. Um, Fantastic. No, uh, really, we, we appreciate being involved. We, obviously, there's a publicity angle to it. But I think the, the whole idea of this is great. It's bang on. It's on message. And we're, we're loving participating. I should mention, I know, Kate, you'll probably talk to other colleagues on these interviews, but I should doff my cap to my parent company, the AA, who, of course, are also partaking. But I know this conversation is particularly about drive tech, but the AA have quite a significant role to play in Evros as well. And uh, we're, we're all pleased to be participating. 
Marvellous. Uh, well, um, unfortunately, that is about all we've got time for, Colin. And um, it has been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, and thank you to Drive Tech UK for joining Greenfleet Talks. Thank you, Kate. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've enjoyed it. Thank pleasure. you. Yep. And thank you for watching. Please tune in to GF365 again soon. Mm -hmm.